And now, Education Talk with the Dean presents. You know, every day, there's at least one student that comes into the school and disrupts the school environment. Yep. Whether it's in the classroom, the hallways, cafeteria, it's always one. And then I'm sure there's always one staff member, or two or three, who just want to grab that student and just and so throw that student out the window. Right? So, so there's this thing right now, where, and it's, 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 not, it's not anything that's unknown, but every school that's the top ten, like the students, right? Um, <laughs> Those top ten schools never take days off. No, but it's, all, it's the top ten for teachers, too. Oh, it is for teachers. Oh, listen. Teachers, you guys have a top ten? Top ten. Like, listen, me and you, monkey bars, three o'clock, me and the <laughs> Um So my thing is, and I wish more schools did this activity, but if you, let's say they're 10 students, um, same behaviors, but you know these are the ones that have the majority of the referrals. If you write their name on large sheets of paper, one name per sheet, spread it around the room, and have the teachers go around and put a sticker under the name of the kid they have a relationship with, and then have a conversation with afterwards. What you'll see is that the kids with the most incidents, they have the least number of stickers on their names because a lot of people don't form relationships with them. So then the question is, okay, nothing's a one-stop shop, there's no magic pill, but if that kid had more established relationships to where they didn't have to be disruptive, for whatever, because behavior is communication. I'm throwing a chair because there's something going on. And that's not a normal behavior. Mm -hmm. What can we do? Part of it is that if I, as the teacher, if I'm not the one because the relationship I established is not a good one, mm -hmm. I should be okay enough to say, you know what, I'm a technical. I'm going to see if somebody else can form a relationship with that student because it's not about me. What adult can reach this kid? And that's just one level. We're also talking about, for the most instructive students, what type of behavior plans are in place that are going to work. We're looking at the family. What support can we provide for the family? Because sometimes the family is dealing with stuff too. Um, and then we talk about trauma, right? That's another topic. That's another flavor of the month, right? Yeah. Dealing with trauma. Um, but I also bring it back to the school. Kids come in traumatized. Fine. I was traumatized here. I, I had things I was dealing with on the outside. I brought it in. I had to deal with it, right? But how are the adults in the building further traumatizing that child? What are mm. some of the teachers and the adults doing to traumatize that kid, trigger, re trigger that kid? Mm -hmm. If, as a kid, as a second grader, if I'm doing something wrong, low level behavior, whatever, get sent out the room and you lock the door behind me, What's the message you're giving? If you're telling me that you're not welcome back in my room unless you have an, a parent with you, what message are you giving? Especially over a low level behavior. We're traumatizing the kid. And it's something that, again, not just specific to my building, but it's a real issue. And if we really got down to the nitty gritty, right, we already have solutions there. But we're just so used to reacting. We're so used to saying, okay, here comes Johnny. We know what's going to happen, so let me get ready. He acts up in the hallway before we get to my classroom. And I'm sending him out. I don't want no part of Johnny today, right? Yeah, yeah. We have to shift that whole mindset of being punitive all the time mm -hmm. to where, as a teacher, I'm also kind of like this kid's parent. Let me figure out what's really going on with him so that he feels comfortable enough in my room to learn from me. And if that doesn't work, then we have behavior plans in place. We're going to modify the expectations so that he feels success somehow. If we have a point system here, if the goal of every student is to make sure they maintain 24 points in the day, they have the opportunities to earn points in 24 is the total. If I know for Johnny, he's based on data. He normally falls in the 13, 14 range as far as the most amount of points he can earn because he's being safe, he's being responsible, he's being respectful. Let me modify the expectation to 10. Johnny, you earn 10 points today and you get this type of incentive. And let's see how that goes. He keeps hitting 10 or above 10, okay, let's push that number up. Let's see if he gets 12 this time. And then he continues from there. 
So we're constantly adjusting plans while that kid is feeling success. They won't be as disruptive. If that doesn't work, now we're moving on to a different level. Let's be more intensive. Let's see if we can do like small groups that focus in on his most disruptive behavior. If he's an angry kid, let's put him in a group with a counselor to deal with that anger. Worst case scenario, we know that he needs the most intensive services that the district can provide. He might need to be in a smaller classroom where there are more adults in there, like an 812 or something like that. And then he will have the capability to receive the learning that's presented. But constantly dealing with the fact that a kid is disruptive and then that's the end of the conversation, that'll never work. It'll never work. It hasn't worked. And obviously that's how the school the present pipeline even starts. Where you label when the kid is disruptive and then that's the end. You know, you, you can't we keep referencing relationship building. You know, it's funny. When I'm about in the community and I'm shopping or whatever I'm at, I always see the students. Every time I see them, they're like, hi, dad. And I go, I'm not your dad. Mm -hmm. I'm not your dad. But then I realize, I am that. Yeah. I am that. Yeah. That relationship was built, right? That means that means a lot to them. Mm -hmm. So when I think about that and what you're saying, like, that's important. Mm -hmm. Relationship building is key. You give a student a platform to be heard, yep. change can happen. You know, it's, I just... I want to tell you, teachers, parents, students, relationship building is key. With that, you can change a child's life, mm -hmm. their outcome. Remember that. So there's a lot of talk surrounding low attendance rates in schools, if you will. Um, parents, your child needs to be in school, period. <laughs> they need to be in school. So what's your role when it comes to attendance? I'm actually, I'm the administrator on the attendance committee. Oh. So um, I meet monthly, my team and I, we meet monthly with the district attendance uh, person mm -hmm. who comes in. She has our numbers. We sit down, we try to come up with what stands. Um, we found that that wasn't enough, having a meeting once a month with someone who's not in the building. That's not really enough. It's not beneficial. We'll keep it, but let's add on to it. So then we decided as a committee, we need to meet just by ourselves once a month, drill down the numbers, figure out where kids are on that spectrum. If they miss 10 days of school, 15, 20 days of school, who's going to reach out to the kid's family? What kind of services or support does that family need? Mm -hmm. We will handle that. Found out that that wasn't enough. We were catching them too late. Um, so then we had a subcommittee created where I'm on part of that subcommittee where we meet by weekly. So now we're looking at numbers again. We know who we call them red flag kids. Kids who have missed a certain percentage of days or past school year. We know they got a red flag on day one of the following school year to make sure that they're in the building. So now part of the subcommittee, we're looking at those numbers even further. We're trying to get ahead of the game. Um, so we found after doing that, it's still not enough. Not enough. Not enough. Because you have to, and I call it all the time I say this, you got to be creatively crazy. You got to figure out a way where we are addressing the need. And if the need is they can't get into the bill for whatever the reason is, that means we got to go to them. So we have different initiatives that we're going to try to start next year. If it's not start next year, it's still on the table to get this thing going, like a walking school bus. And that's something we found. Um, we did some research. We actually took a trip down to Baltimore. Um, to look at some of the schools down there. This is something that worked for them to boost their numbers. All the kids in the community that we know struggle with walking to the building day to day because mom is waking up late, or maybe parents are already- Get up on time, mom. Come on, come on. <laughs> no excuse. Everyone has a cell phone with an alarm clock on it. Well, I got a story to <laughs> um, So if that's the issue, so let's pay a parent in the community who's willing to help out in the building anyway. They can help out like volunteer, but we're gonna pay them. You walk around the community and you start picking up kids who we know are our frequent flyers for kids who want to show up. Wow. wow. And you know they get the vest on and they're walking and the parents who actually sign up to have their kid part of this, they get picked up from the door, brought down to the school, and then they get brought back afterwards. Um, it's found in other communities to work, especially the urban community. And um, that's just another initiative, again, being creatively crazy. Who would have thought, right? Yeah, who would have thought? Who would have thought? But the conversation can't be, it's always the parents. The parents got to do it. The parents got 
obviously something's going on where either it's not important enough for the kid's school or there's something preventing that kid from coming to school. So forget about the blame. What can we do to help? So if that's not going to work with walking school bus, what else can we do? Do we need to rent a van and go door to door and pick kids up in the van? If that's what it takes, that's what we'll do because we also understand that if the kid's not in school, they're not going to But if that's not the motivation, our numbers are dictated by the kids that are in the building. So if our uh, performance numbers or efficiency numbers are low because the kids who aren't showing up and then they show up and they the test, and then they pretty much bomb the test, and we care about those numbers, it's going to come back down to what attendance. What can we do? We cannot, as educators, keep going back to the well when it does not work. Talking about students and their attendance, let's talk about parents and their attendance. Parents. So, what do you do to increase parent involvement? Them being creatively crazy. Um, I don't creatively know, crazy. Creatively crazy. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if it's a. I'll say this community because I don't know if it's most urban communities, but just talking about PTA kind of makes like the hair on a lot of parents' neck stand up because mm -hmm. of that. And I have, I have school age kids, and I'm not on their PTA, so mm -hmm. I, I understand, right? And I don't feel bad about that. That's what it is. Um, I was a PTA. Man. Yeah, I'm not. No. Five dollar dues, five dollars is too much. Man, man. Um, so what can we do if we know we have a school PTA, two parents show up each month, and we keep saying join the PTA, join the PTA, you know, go out in the community, join the PTA, and we're still not getting more than two parents. What can we do? We can blame the parents to say, you know what, you should be here. This is your child's education. You need to care. Blah blah blah. Or we have to find a way around it. So we're kind of looking at this twofold. One, you cannot have a PTA meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Tuesday when people are at work. Right. Right. Um, again, just being in general, because it might be different for other people. But if you are available at 10 o'clock on a Tuesday morning, and it's not because you work a third shift, more than likely money is not an issue. Right? Because somebody else is providing. Yeah, yeah. But if you're working, extended hours, or even working overnight and you're sleep during the morning, you're not coming to PTA. You need to learn other, you need to get that information a different way. So we can make sure every event that we do, we are announcing all the initiatives we're doing in the building to every parent that shows. We can continue to have a PTA. We can look at, like I said, the walking in the school bus where we're actually paying stipends to parents who really want to be here, so that's more of an incentive. Um, we can have like a PBIS for parents, which we've already started. We actually um, raffled off a, what was it, 40 inch flat screen TV. A 40 inch? 40 inch that was donated um, by the community. So let's raffle this off. You come to, and I'm not taking credit for this, this was not me. This was our um, community coordinator. But she came up with like a punch card, like with Stewart's, where if you punch at certain times, you get milk, mm -hmm. you get free milk. So there's a punch card here at the building where if you come to five events, then you get another punch, you earn some type of reward, whether it's cash, whether it's being put into the raffle for a 40 inch TV. Oh, that's great. Man, that's so, great. That's great. That's great. So, again, it's that incentive. And that's different, too. That's it's different. different. Because, again, if you don't ask the parents what do they need in order for them to come, then you're just spinning your wheels because you're not coming with the same frame of mind. Mm -hmm. I can say all day, I don't understand why you're not coming to PTA. But if you don't ask them, it's because I'm working at this time. It's because I have a kid here, I got a kid in a different building over here, it's because I'm working third shift, or it's because, you know, I can help out in different ways. Now, how do we address them? The other side of it is, and I'm going to put this on the teachers, you have to contact parents. I can't call, I can't call 620 families. I can try, I, I, I can try, but it's not going to happen. 600? Yeah, yeah. But... A teacher can contact 20 or so parents within the span of a whatever amount of time just to let them know we have this going on, we have this going on. You can join the PTA, but if not, we also have this going on, just to kind of drive that conversation as well. Some teachers are doing an excellent job doing that. A lot of teachers need some help. Administrators need help. Everyone kind of needs to kind of join in on this list. Um, but again, it is what it is. But as, as a parent, I can understand how difficult it is to go here one night, here a different night, I already worked all day, so I'm really not trying to sit in a meeting and listen, listen. 
you have to be, like I said before, creatively crazy. What can you do outside of the box that's really going to feed the need that some of these parents have? And then that's what we do. If it doesn't work, try something different. Well, folks, I'm going to tell you, if you are hearing this conversation, it's deep. This is a very, very deep conversation. Let me ask you this, man. When it's all said and done, what's the end game? What legacy do you want to leave behind? So, and this one's personal for me. Um, right? Well, I have a, I have a stepfather. Um, I married my mom a while ago. And uh, you know, I thank God for him every day. Mm -hmm. But there was a period of time I didn't have a positive male role model in my life. So, when you have any child, especially young boys, without that positive influence, mm -hmm. identity is an issue. For them. So for me, there was a large span of time where identity was a major issue for me. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know where my people were from. None of these things were presented to me. And of course, as a single mom, you do what you can. You do what you need to. You're both parents, but there's still a whole thing. So I had to figure all that out. So I say that to say this, um, I'm a proud father, um, and me too, yeah, <laughs> there you go, just in case they ask, I did <laughs> mention them, I'll put their name on them. So I'm a proud dad, um, proud husband, and part of my legacy is what I leave behind for them. Um, I am the first in my family to complete college, to get a degree, to go past that, like, I'm the trailblazer, that constant conversation that you have, you gotta be the first person, that was me. Um, so now, part of my legacy on a personal level is making it so that my kids don't even see that going to college is an option and that option might not be for me. This is the role that you're on, now what are you gonna do with it? So that's part of the legacy. Um, on the professional side, and it's always been a dream of mine, not even a dream, it's gonna happen. At some point in my career, I'm going to start a school um, where I'm from in South Carolina. So that's part of the end game. If everything's all said and done, I'm also going to have a school somewhere in Ghana. That's been on my heart for years. A school in Ghana. In Ghana. Um, so I am going to, I'm not talking about being an AP at a school or being a principal. I'm building a school where a lot of these values that I know are important can be kind of replicated so that it, it helps the kids in that community. If I can get that accomplished, I mean, I'm good, I'm good. Um, where I am now, that's more of the end game, um, I also look at things in stages and I constantly reflect. If I'm able to shift the mindset of the adults in this building to where they see that it's more than kids in a seat, you in the front, you're teaching a concept, you're taking a test, passing the test. If they can see that it's more than that, and that they have work to do, maybe not even have the answer, but they know that there's more to it, I'm good, I'm good. Because now it's on them, they can't blame ignorance, they can't say, well, I didn't know. They have all the information now, they have all the data to support it, they have administrators who support them. What can we do now? I'm good, I'm good. Um, I mean, and just, again, on a personal level, it's always gonna be about what I leave for my little ones. Um, what, what can I do to be a better man, to be a better father, to be a better husband, to be a better administrator, to be a better teacher, to be a better educator? I haven't stopped being a teacher just because I switched titles. That's another thing I don't like. I don't like titles and labels. I'm Mr. Rogers. How I look on Monday, you're going to get me the same way on Tuesday. When I eventually get to the next stage in my career, I'm still going to be Mr. Rogers. I call it like I see it. I tell that like it is, um, and I wear my passion on my sleeve. Um, so that, you know, just going back to your question, the end game for me is that, you know, if I can just shift people's mentality, um, especially people of color, people of color that I serve, um, people of color I'm responsible for, and kind of shift their mentality as well, open up doors for them, I'm good. Uh, man, I wish we had more time. But before we go, mm -hmm. if there was a word yep. that you can give to your students and your families just to inspire them, yep. what would that be? Um, I'll give you a word and a half. Word and, and a half. What that looks like. <laughs> I would say, honestly, be unapologetic. Be unapologetic. Unapologetic. Um, and not in a negative way. I don't 
apologize for doing the right thing. However that looks. I, I'm not going to apologize for it. I'm not going to apologize for the path that I took to get to where I am. Um, I'm not going to apologize for the conversations that I've had to build people up. I'm not going to apologize for telling the truth. Um, I am who I am for good or for bad because I know where my heart is and I know what my vision is. So if you are not willing to compromise who you are, or just to think that you have to apologize for being who you are, you don't apologize. Well, Mr. Rogers told you all what his word was, a word and a half. Until next time, be safe.